Dear Lord, I just invite your Holy Spirit here. And Lord, as we uh, talk about you and as we talk about what you're doing in, in the world and in our lives and here at Charity, um, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you were with us in 2016. We thank you that as we look back, we can see your hand. And we know that you're guiding us, that you're there with us when we can't, when we're struggling, when we're in need of comfort, Lord, you are there. And then, Lord, when we're rejoicing, you're rejoicing with us. And so, Lord, we thank you for the year of 2016 and what it was. And, Lord, we also ask that as we look at 2017, Lord, we pray that, that your hand would guide us. We thank you that your promise is that you are with us and that you never, will never leave us or forsake us. And, Lord, that's an amazing promise. And so, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we invite your presence here. In your name I pray. Amen. So how many of you guys had an awesome Christmas? Anybody else have an awesome Christmas? Yeah, how many of you guys got snowed in for Christmas? Yeah, Christmas, uh, Christmas 2016 was crazy. I know that uh, we actually uh, went down to Sioux Falls, and uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law are here from Virginia, and not only do they think that North Dakota is the coldest place on earth, but they think it's the hottest place on earth, because the very first time, uh, or one of the times that they came here in June, it never got below 100, and one of the days that they were here was 113, and so they're like, this is the hottest place on the planet. And then, you know, there was that uh, day a couple years ago where it was 45 below without wind chill, without wind, you know, wind chill. And they're like, not only is it the hottest place, it's the coldest place. Who lives in North Dakota, you know? <laughs> you guys must be crazy. And uh, anyway, so we drew, drove down to Sioux Falls, and we hit uh, freezing rain from Fargo on down to Sioux Falls. And I can tell you what, we got there at 2.30 in the morning, and <laughs> I had to pry my fingers, like, off the steering wheel, you know. And, uh, and I could tell by my, mother, my mother-in-law and father-in-law's expression, they're like, what did we just do coming up here for, for Christmas, you know? <laughs> anyway, so then we got home after the blizzard, and uh, we had seriously a drift that went from the ground all the way up over the top of our, uh, um, our uh, door and up to our uh, roof, and that's what we were welcomed home to. So it was, it was a pretty big blizzard. But, you know, I, I do have to say that um, as I look out at this congregation, I am so thankful for you guys because... I'm sure that, um, that I, I cannot believe the amount of support um, that you guys have given me and my family, um, especially with that last letter that went out telling, telling about our, my plans to transition to Circle C Ranch full time. But we have received so much support from you all, and we're so thankful. I mean, this Christmas was the best ever. It was, it was awesome. Um, in fact, somebody, I don't know who this family is, they're our Christmas angels, they gave me this sweater, and they gave all of my kids um, these footy uh, uh, kind of slippers and stuff like that. So I wanted to show you guys a picture. There they are right there. And, uh, <laughs> and they gave them all kinds of sorts of clothes. I mean, seriously, it was like the best gifts ever. And uh, so a huge thank you to, uh, for making... Uh, um, Christmas, so great uh, for our family this year. Um, well, you know, as we look at New Year's, how many of you guys have made New Year's resolutions? Okay, not very many. <laughs> how many of you have given up on New Year's resolutions? <laughs> okay, most of you, most of you. Well, you know, I love these kind of sayings that you see every once in a while um, about uh, resolutions or just life, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight. I'm going to exercise every day. I'm going to go on a diet and stick to it. Is that cake? <laughs> and then I like this one. A New Year's, my New Year's resolution is to eat healthy and lose weight. But first I need to eat all the unhealthy food in the house so it's not there to tempt me. <laughs> I thought that was great. And then I love Kelvin and Hobbes. Resolutions, me? Just what are you implying? That I need to change? Well, buddy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfect the way I am. <laughs> And then I love this one. Here's a New Year's resolution for... <laughs> lose, lose weight. More. Again. Get fit. Next year. Give up alcohol and cigarettes. Drink less. Stand up to boss. Fine job. <laughs> be nicer to my wife. Try to be nicer to my wife. Be nicer to my ex-wife. <laughs> and sort out junk in life and shed. And I thought that that was so appropriate. 
Um, now, here's the thing. A resolution, um, by definition, a resolution is a decision, something that we make. And um, what I wanted to look at is actually the reality, okay? And so I looked at what the definition of reality is, and it states that it's the world or state of things as they actually exist as opposed to an idealistic or notional idea of them. And I think about our New Year's resolutions, how often they are based in this kind of ideology of what I want to look like. You know, I want to get fit and all this kind of stuff, or how we want to act, these decisions that we make. And a lot of times it seems like they never really last. But here's the deal. As followers of Jesus Christ, there is a reality that we live in. There is a reality that we live in. And, um, in talking about the reality, one of the things that I love about Scripture, and we see it again and again and again throughout Scripture, is there's this cycle. Okay? And when you read Scripture, what you have to understand is that God put all of Scripture in there for a reason. And it's for our understanding and understanding of how life actually works. Okay? What God is actually doing in this whole crazy thing, story that he made is he is bringing out of the world a people dedicated to himself. It's called the story of redemption. And so in that story, what we see is that, and we see this especially throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel, God, cho God chose them and said, you are my people. And then what we see is we see this cycle where the people, they realize that God is their God and they follow him. And then they prosper. And they become apathetic. And after they become apathetic, they turn to other gods and they start worshiping other gods. And as a result, God allows some kind of disaster, some nation to conquer them. They become oppressed, and they cry out to God, and they say, Lord, help me. And the Lord hears their prayers, and he saves them. And they start to follow him. And they follow him. And, and this cycle happens again and again and again throughout the Old Testament, throughout history. But what it really illustrates is that there's this cycle that's going on in each one of our lives as well. This cycle where we say, Lord... And, and, and we can see it as ups and downs or whatever. But it's this cycle, and I, I've seen it in my own life, where there's times where it's like, oh, God, my relationship with you, I, I'm, loving, I'm loving you, I'm loving life. I, I still go through the same problems, but I handle them a whole lot different. And then I start to fall away, and I feel this distance, and I, I just feel, you know, I just don't handle life the same way. And there's this oppression that kind of happens, and sometimes it's because of sin or whatever. And I'm just like, Lord, something is not right. Things are wrong. And I cry out to him. And maybe it's a circumstance or a situation, whatever it is. But I cry out to him and I say, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. And God hears and answers. And especially as I look back, I see where God has answered these prayers and come and delivered me and, and saved me. And so we see this in our own life. And that's the reality that we as God's people live in. Um, you know, I think that uh, um, it doesn't just apply to us personally, but it applies to us as churches as well. And um, as I think about charity... And I think about this church, you are what make up Charity Lutheran Church. Okay, there's the staff, there's the vision council, but ultimately, you are what make up Charity Lutheran Church. You are Charity Lutheran. Okay, we have this building and stuff like that, but you are Charity Lutheran. And you know what, right now, as I say that, boy, can we use your prayers. As the staff, as, as leaders at this church, boy, can we use your prayers. Because as Charity Lutheran, as, as we ask God what he would have for us, um, we know that God's will is good and that he has great plans for charity. But boy, can we use, can we use your prayers as we deal with, with life and stuff like that. But at our annual meeting, um, Scott brought this up. And I thought it was so appropriate. Because I think that as we face 2017 as Charity Lutheran Church or as God's people, maybe you, maybe you aren't... You have, don't come here on a regular basis or whatever. But as God's people, as we look at 2017, this is what I believe God has for Charity Lutheran. And um, this is a prophetic word given in 2000. It says this, The Lord God would say to you, Charity Lutheran, that I am with you. That I am with you. And I have made you to be a terebinth. You are an oak in the midst of time, where there are storms upon the land, even as the storms come across the prairies with fierceness, I have called you to be an oak in the midst of this time. God has called us to be an oak in the midst of this time. And to stand and to stand and to continue to stand. For you are a shelter. You are a haven to many that I will draw under your mighty branches. I have established you and I have planted you. I have raised you up from a seed and made you strong in my might and in my power. And it is for this time. 
and for the days ahead that I have called you to be in this place for the storms will continue to come. And you know what? God probably says that to you personally. The storms will continue to come. But I am with you, and I am your strength. I am the source of life that runs through you, for you are my oak of righteousness, and I am with you, and I will stand with you, and no one shall take you down. For you are my tree, you are my oak, you are my terebinth, says the Lord. That's what God says to charity. That's God's promise to charity. That there will be storms, but we will stand and stand and continue, continue to stand. Not through our own strength, but through the Lord's strength. And I love what it says in Isaiah 61. We are here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. You, as Charity Lutheran Church, as the people that make up this great congregation, you are called. And that's what we're called to. 2017, I can promise you, there's going to be problems. There's going to be issues. There's going to be storms. There's going to be things that we face as a church. There's going to be things that you face personally. There's going to be things that that we have to deal with, and yet God's promise is sure. And so what I wanted to do today is I wanted to go back to 2 Chronicles um, 7, 12 through, uh, I think it's 15, um, because I think this was a a point where God was talking to his people, and God said, you know, I want you to build me this temple. And then what we know is that God came, and when that temple was built, it it was built with all this amazing artistry, all this, these amazing dimensions, and then God's glory filled the temple. And the people of Israel, they saw it. They saw God in a real way. And you want to know what's crazy? As I look at Charity Lutheran Church, as I look at you, you want to know what I see? I see God moving in crazy and awesome ways. Amen? God does something through this church. And you know what? I, I've I grew up as kind of a little bit of a mutt at churches, okay? Um, I went to a lot of different churches growing up. I went to a non-denominational Bible school and stuff like that. I believe that God has a very special calling for the people of Charity Lutheran Church. I believe that we are shelter. I believe that we are real. I believe that we are honest with our stuff, but we're honest that God is the one that we go to for strength. I believe that God has called us for this time, for this season, and for an amazing purpose. Amen? Amen. And you are what makes up Charity Lutheran Church. And so in this story, um, the glory of the Lord has filled the temple, and this is right after they've offered all these crazy crazy sacrifices. And uh, the Lord appears to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. And I think what God would say to Charity is, I have chosen this place. For you to come and worship. I have chosen this place to be a place where people come and experience the Lord. Where they come and they experience relationship. Where they come and they can be honest about the junk. They can be honest about the stuff that they're dealing with. And they can come and they can say, I need help. And we're there to help them. Okay? At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls. Or command grasshoppers to devour your crops. Or send plagues among you. How many of you have a little bit of a tough time with that verse? Does that sound like a loving God? You know, I think that what happens is in our, in our culture right now, it's really easy to look at God and say, you're a God of love, and that's great. But you know what? When we look at God as a God of justice, oh, I don't know if I like that so much. And yet what God does, God is constantly pursuing relationship. And so let me ask your parents out there. <laughs> When you're dealing with your kids, do you sometimes deliberately cause suffering in their life? (laughs) And there's a couple hands that are like, yeah, we do. (laughs) Why do you do it? Why do you cause suffering in in your children's life? To make them better. They need it. Because you love them. You know what? God, 
He does it perfectly. He does it perfectly. And he says, because I love you so much, I might do this. And it's not just personally in our lives. Sometimes it's nationally. Sometimes it affects a nation. Sometimes it affects a world. Sometimes it affects a congregation. And sometimes it goes right at us personally. And God says that cycle, that cycle where you have fallen away from me and you're worshiping other gods and you're going to other sources for a sense, a sense of security, a sense of peace. If you're going to other gods, I don't want it because I love you. So I'm, at times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grass efforts to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Because here's what I want. 2 Chronicles 7.14 then if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will restore their land. What is God's ultimate desire in all of this? He wants restoration. He wants relationship. He wants us to walk with him and to experience him and to know him. And so this verse, I love this verse, and I know that you, many of you have probably heard this verse before, but what I love about this verse and what I, my life verse is, is Micah 6, 8. And it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And the reason I love that verse is because it gives me a practical steps of how to live. What I love about this verse is it gives us practical steps of what God wants to do in our life. Personally, of what God wants to do in our church, of what God wants to do in our nation, of what God wants to do in our world. And so we're going to go through this, this uh, verse, and we're going to go through it kind of piecemeal and kind of see what God is really saying. So then the first one we're going to focus on is this one. Then if my people who are called by my name, then if my people who are called by my name, let me ask, ask this. Are you God's people? Yes. Yes. If my people, when you trust Jesus Christ, Paul gives this amazing picture of adoption. He, he says, it was like you had no family. But when you trusted Jesus Christ, you became part of this crazy family. Of this crazy family that doesn't just span genders. That doesn't just span um, nationalities. It spans time. And I don't know, how many of you guys have ever, on a plane or a bus, ever met somebody who's a follower of Jesus Christ, and there's this instant sense of kinship? There's this instant sense where, you know what, this person is my person. These are my people. And there's, like, I, I've done it so many times, we go down to Guatemala, and I meet people, and I can barely speak their language, and they trust in Jesus Christ, and it's my brother, it's my sister. I can't even speak their language, but there is this kinship that happens. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you become his people. But I love that portion right here because he says, you are called by my name. You are called by my name. How many of you guys realize that you are called? Okay, not as many hands went up as I'd like to see. Because here's the reality. You're all called. You are absolutely all called. In other words, you know what? Sometimes people think, hey, Sam, can you come and talk to my friend about Jesus because they need to know Jesus. And you know what? That's fine. I appreciate that. But you know what? I cannot step into your life and impact the people the, the same way that you can. Pastor Scott, Pastor Randy, the staff at Charity, we cannot step into your life and impact people that are in your life the way that you can. Only you. Only you. And you know, we're called, as God's people, we're called as representatives we're called to be his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears. We're called his representatives. And people look at us and say, that person represents Jesus Christ to me. Are you called? You are called. You are absolutely called. But here's one thing that I love about that. You are called by whose name? His name. See, one thing that happens is sometimes people think that, you know, they think that, that me as a pastor, 
that I get up here and I have all these gifts, right? They think, okay, Sam, he can preach in front of people. He can talk to large groups of people. That's, that's his gifting. And you know what? I'm here to tell you <laughs> that most of the time I'm like, what in the world am I doing? And, but you know what God tells me every single time? God says, Sam, I'm calling you to get up there and talk. But it's not about you. Who's it about? It's about him. It's about him. And so, you know, we can look at our own lives and we can say, man, I'm a mess. I have made a disaster of life. But you know what? Is it about you? It's about him. You're called by his name. Amen? Amen. 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 You're called by his name. And then he goes on to say this. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. And the term there is this Greek term for getting on our knees. It's this Greek term for, for this sense of repentance and, Lord, I have messed up. Lord, I'm so sorry. I have made a mistake of things. I'm in that cycle where I have worshipped other gods. I have gone to these other things. I have made sex or money or um, whatever it is. Sometimes it's even our family. I have put them in front of you, God. And as a result, there is all these consequences. And I'm at my wit's end. I don't know how to deal with it anymore. There's these relationships that have been destroyed. There's stuff that is, oh, Lord, save me. Save me, God. I can't do it. And it's when we truly humble ourselves and say, Lord, I cannot make it without you. I absolutely cannot make it. And you know what? That's the point that God wants us to come to. He wants us to come to it personally. He wants to, us to come to it as a congregation. He wants us to come to it nationally. Amen? He wants us to humble ourselves and say, we cannot make it without you, Jesus. We cannot make it without you, Lord. That we will humble ourselves. But you want to know what's absolutely crazy? Is that God's promise is that he will hear that he will hear us. It's, it's crazy because um, as I'm dealing with my kids, what I've noticed is that there are certain cries that I respond to instantly. Okay? When I listen to my kids cry, especially my youngest two right now, there are certain cries that I will run to get them. It's not the cry of annoyance. I know that cry. Okay? It's not the cry when, when maybe my, one of the other ones has stolen a toy or something like that. It's not a cry of frustration. When I hear, and as parents, you know this cry. When I hear that they are in the process of being hurt, and they are going to get hurt worse, I instantly, instantly run, and I get there as quick as I possibly can. You guys, have you guys experienced that? You know what? The Bible tells us that a broken and a contrite heart God will not ignore. There is a cry of our heart that God says, I will respond to it, and I will respond as quickly, as quickly as is good for you. I will respond as quickly as is good for you. And I love these verses, and these are verses in the Old Testament. Um, these are examples of what God did. And both of these kings, by the way, both of these kings were awful kings. Okay? It's talking about two people in the history of Israel that were absolutely awful kings. In fact, Manasseh sacrificed his children on the, on the altar to Baal, okay? So that, he was that bad of a king. But here's what it says. Okay, 1 Kings 21, 27 through 29. So it was when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth. And he went about mourning. And those words were that God was going to send destruction on, on Israel. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. We see it where God turns and God says, here's my justice. Here's the justice that as a just God, I will lay upon you. But here's my mercy. And when you, when you humble yourselves, I respond. And then in 2 Chronicles 33, 10 through 13, it says, And the Lord spoke to Manasseh um, and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the armies of the kings of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty. 
heard his supplication and brought him back into Jerusalem, into his, king, into his kingdom. And here's the point. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. God allowed some crappy stuff to happen to Manasseh, but it was for a point. It was that God wanted a relationship. God wanted Manasseh to know who was God. Next one. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And pray. A while ago we did a book called The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. And uh, one line in there just totally impacted my life. And what it said is it said, it's so sad to think of the prayers that have not been answered because they were never prayed. It's so sad to think of the prayers that were never answered because they were never prayed. And God's word reiterates this. It says, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. Now, I have seen prayer in my life, do some amazing things. Right now, just to kind of give you a quick example, in the course of my life, I have always said, Lord, if I could someday live in a log cabin, that would be awesome. Okay? And there was other times I said, Lord, if I could have a creek going around a log cabin, that would be really cool. And if there could be ponds with lily pads, that would be really cool, Lord. And Lord, if I could have a big red barn, that would be awesome. Do you want to know where I live right now? I live in a log cabin. Portion of our house has this log portion that I absolutely love. We have this stream that runs around our house with about 20 ponds. And do you know what is in those ponds? Lily pads. It's loaded with lily pads. And you know what? There's, I don't think there's another place in North Dakota that I've ever been that has lily pads. Lily pads do not grow in North Dakota ponds on, uh, regularly. And you want to know what we have that I look out of my window every single morning? A big red barn. I have seen God answer prayers in amazing ways. And if you want to hear some more amazing God stories, hang out with me. Because I'll tell you amazing God story after amazing God story. The whole place that I live is a God story. It's one God story after another of God providing and God doing this. But you know what? I've also seen God answer in crazy ways instantly. I can remember one time I was over in Russia, and uh, maybe some of you guys have heard this story, but I was at an orphanage, okay? And one of the things that I always lose my passport. I have trouble, I have trouble with passports, okay? And uh, anyways, we were at this orphanage, and we went, we went to a market. Um, it was, we went to a church, and then afterwards we went to this market. And um, so we're walking around the market, and we're always supposed to have a copy of our passport on us. And we're looking around the market, and all of a sudden this guy comes up and he says, let me see your passport. And I start feeling in my, in my coat for my passport, right? For my copy of my passport. And I'm looking, and have you ever had that awful, awful, awful feeling like, I am in such trouble. Because I could not find that passport. And this guy, I'm like, I can't find this passport. And this guy searches me. And then starts pushing me towards this vehicle, okay? It's like a minivan kind of vehicle. And he starts pushing me towards this vehicle. And I had been to a, a, a prison the day before, and it was like 15 guys in this little tiny room about the size of this part of the stage, and there's a little broken toilet in the corner. And they're pushing me towards this vehicle, and I'm thinking, I have no idea where they're taking me. I, have, I don't speak the language. I don't even know the address that I'm living at, you know? And so... They start pushing me into this vehicle, and I seriously put my hands on the top of this minivan type thing, and I braced my feet in the bottom, and I said, I am not going. And I said, dear Jesus, save me now. <laughs> and I was praying so hard. I mean, I was praying so hard. And these guys are pushing me into the vehicle, and they all have AK-47s, by the way, okay? They're pushing me into this vehicle, and I'm just like, oh, Lord, save me, save me, save me. <laughs> you know? And all of a sudden, this other officer walked around the front of the vehicle and says, dumb American, let him go. <laughs> and I can tell you what, I had to go change my pants, but that's okay. Because I did not have to go get in that vehicle. Prayer sometimes works in the craziest ways. 
Anybody else ever experienced a God moment where God instantly answered a prayer that you needed to answer instantly? Yeah. God loves to answer prayer. God loves to answer prayer. And you know what? I, I don't know. 1050. Okay. What I figured that we're going to do. <laughs> I knew I was going to run out of time, but, uh, but you guys are awesome. What I'd like to do is um, we're going to go through some of the prayers that you can pray. Pray for forgiveness. Go to God and say, Lord, I, I have made a mess of things. I need your help. There's prayers of forgiveness that, that we need to give. There's pray, pray for our country. Does our country need prayer? It absolutely needs prayer. And we need to be the ones that are praying for it. Pray for our church. Like I said, charity can really use your prayers. You as the people of, of charity, for our staff, for our leadership, for decisions that we're making, we really could use your prayers. Pray for our needs and others around us. And you know, I was thinking about that this morning because there are so many people in my life that I forget to pray for. I pr forget to pray for God's protection on them. I forget to pray um, for God to lead them and guide them and help them to, to know his will and his purpose. So what we're going to do right now is we're just going to take a couple minutes. And I'm just going to invite you to just bow your heads, close your eyes. And if you want to pray out loud, you can. If you just want to pray in your heart, but pray for these things. Because, boy, God loves to answer prayers. He loves to hear us. He, just like us, when, we, when our kids come to us and they ask, for, ask us for something, he loves to give us back gifts. So let's just take, take some, a couple minutes and just pray. Just pray. Dear Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the noise of those little children. Because, Lord, what we want for them is that they would follow you, that they would have a relationship with you, that they would grow up in this community of believers, and they would see examples of Jesus all around them. We pray for our families here. We just ask for your protection over them, Lord Jesus. I just pray for our fathers and our mothers and our grandparents. I just pray for all of our adults. I just ask, Lord Jesus, for your hand on them, that they would know that they are called and that they are essential. I just lift up our people, Father God. Lord, I lift up our church. I ask for your, for your will to be done here. I lift up our country. I ask, I ask your, for your, your direction for our leaders. Guide them, Lord Jesus. Protect them. And I pray for the needs of others around us, Lord. Lord, we need you. We absolutely need you, Father God. And we cannot make it without you, Lord. Be with us. In your name I pray. Amen. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and that portion, seek my face, you know, one thing that I love about that is that it doesn't say seek my hand. It says seek my face. And when we're face to face with somebody, it means this real relationship. It means this point where we can say, I know you, and you know me. Because the crazy thing is that God knows every single thing about you. He knows all the mistakes that you have made. He knows all the mistakes that you will make. And you know what? There's nothing you can do to earn his love. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any more or any less. 
He loves you that much. And what he would want for you guys is he would want not only for you to understand that he knows you, but that you would know him. Because when you know him, then all the waves, all the wind, all the problems in our life, when our focus is on him, we can deal with them. Just like when Peter, Peter got out of that boat and he said, I'm gonna, I want to follow you, Jesus. And he started walking on the water. And as long as his focus was on Jesus, he was walking. But when his focus fell, then he sank. And you can keep on playing, Bubba, because I like that. And we're actually going to close. But I want to close with this in mind. You are his people. You are called by his name. And that is, as followers of Jesus Christ, whether you're from this congregation or not, that if we do this, and if we will humble ourselves, if we will pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, God's promise is that he will hear from heaven. He will forgive your sins. And he will restore our land. Do we need to be restored? Does America need to be restored? Does charity need to be restored? Do you need to be restored? Yes. Dear Lord, restore us. Restore this church, Father God. Restore our country. Restore our world. Thank you, Lord, that you do call us. And then, Lord, we make mistakes and we mess up, but it's really about you. And so, Lord, help us to humble ourselves. Help us to pray. Help us to seek your face. Help us to turn from our own wickedness. And then heal our land and heal us, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.